Hello, fifth graders. Welcome to Language Arts for today. For today, you will need your copy of Little Women, as well as potentially paper and pencil, particularly if you've been writing down answers as we go. All right, so fifth graders, um, our objectives for today, we've got two things that we're gonna be doing. We're gonna be identifying theme evidence, and we're going to be making an inference. So as a reminder, because it has been a while since um, we, we have talked about themes, because we had a long break, these are our themes that we've been discussing in Little Women. We've been talking about the societal expectations of women, right? So this idea that um, there were certain ways in which women were supposed to be or being expected to act at this time, um, the importance of living a virtuous life, and the relationship between money and happiness. And again, remember, the, it's, it's a question here is does, is there a relationship between money and happiness? And we see that characters aren't necessarily agreeing about this. Also remember that when we're making an inference, we're looking at the clues that are in the text, right? The author tells us some things, but not all things. And we wanna make um, an, draw an educated conclusion <clears throat> from what we do know in order to try and um, figure out what we don't know. Okay, as a heads up, fifth graders, we have a, our quarterly exam. It's coming up on Monday. So we're going to do a little bit of review this week on Friday, and then that, that test will be on Monday. So you want to make sure that you're kind of starting to, to study a little bit, especially those definitions, right? You can assume that those are probably going to show up on any test that you're taking this year. So it would be a great idea to kind of start reviewing some of those uh, vocabulary words and their definitions as we go. So fifth graders, we're gonna get right into today's homework questions. I've been writing comments on your homework. So if you are wondering about chapter 14, you should be going on back and looking at the comments that I've given you from your assignment. And then um, reach out to me. I'm happy to talk through any answers with you that are confusing. Um, I'm happy to kind of go over it a little bit. So we're just gonna jump right into today's questions. So I'm gonna flip you around and let you take a look at <clears throat> yesterday or today's questions. And then we'll get in to our reading. <laughs> So number one asks, what do the marches learn from the telegram? Um, a telegram would have been like an old way of communicating. So faster than mailing a letter, but you know, now we have lots of ways to communicate instantly with people. Um, but at this time, telegrams would have been kind of a, an expensive way of communicating through wires and codes, but it was a way to get a message very quickly from one side of the country to another. Um, and typically was done when there was some sort of urgent message that wanted to be com communicated quickly. So what do they learn from the telegram, which is also sometimes called a telegraph? Two, from where does Marmy get money? Three, how is Mr. Brooke going to help Mrs. March? Four, how is Joe able to offer money? And to which theme might this relate? So remembering, of course, that we need to set up our answer this theme, or this might relate to the theme blank, and then selecting one of the three themes that I just reviewed with you um, at the beginning of this lesson. Six, of what is Meg thinking in particular, she tells us. And then seven, whom do you infer that Meg is thinking of? So I infer that Meg is thinking of blank, okay? So again, looking at what clues we have to help with that inference. And finally, question eight is asking you to create your own sentence following all vocabulary sentence expectations correctly using this word vainly. Remember, vocabulary sentences should be at least six words long and should show me that you understand the definition of the word. So with that, fifth graders, we are going to get right into our reading for today. You should be getting your books open, ready to follow along. We are on page 158 for chapter 15 titled a telegram. <clears throat> November is the most disagreeable month in the whole year, said Margaret, standing at the window one dull afternoon, looking out at the frostbitten garden. That's the reason I was born in it, observed Joe pensively, quite unconscious of the blot on her nose. Some of you have commented on Joe seems always to have a blot, right, ink on her nose because she's writing. If something very pleasant should happen now, we should think it a delightful month, said Beth, who took a hopeful view of everything, even November. I dare say, but nothing pleasant ever does happen in this family, said Meg, 
who is out of sorts. We go grubbing along day after day without a bit of change and very little fun. We might as well be in a treadmill. So we think of a treadmill now as meaning like a piece of exercise equipment, but a treadmill used to be um, like a factory where you would go in and work um, and kind of do the same thing day after day. So a treadmill, she's talking about going off and working in a factory. My patience, how blue we are, cried Joe. I don't much wonder, poor dear, for you see other girls having splendid times while you grind, grind, year in and year out. Oh, don't I wish I could manage things for you as I do for my heroines. You're pretty enough and good enough already, so I'd have some rich relation leave you a fortune unexpectedly. Then you dash out as an heiress, scorn everyone who has slighted you, go abroad, and come home, my lady something, in a blaze of splendor and elegance. People don't have fortunes left them in that style nowadays. Men have to work and women to marry for money. It's a dreadfully unjust world, said Meg bitterly. Kind of strikes me as something that could be like societal expectations of women as we're thinking about themes. Joe and I are going to make fortunes for you all. Just wait 10 years and see if we don't, said Amy, who sat in a corner making mud pies, as Hannah called her little clay models of birds, fruit, and faces. Can't wait, and I'm afraid I haven't much faith in ink and dirt, though I'm grateful for your good intentions. Meg sighed and turned to the frostbitten garden again. Joe groaned and leaned both ab elbows on the table in a despondent attitude. But Amy spat it away energetically, and Beth, who sat at the other window, said, smiling, Two pleasant things are going to happen right now. Marmy is coming down the street, and Laurie is tramping through the garden as if he had something nice to tell. In they both came, Mrs. March with her usual question. Any letter from father, girls? And Laurie to say in his persuasive way, won't some of you come for a drive? I've been working away at mathematics till my head is in a muddle, and I'm going to freshen my wits by a brisk turn. It's a dull day, but the air isn't bad, and I'm going to take Brooke home, so it will be gay inside if it isn't out. Come, Joe, you and Beth will go, won't you? Of course we will. Much obliged, but I'm busy, and Meg whisked out her work basket, for she had agreed with her mother that it was best, for her at least, not to drive often with the young gentleman. We three will be ready in a minute, cried Amy, running away to wash her hands. Can I do anything for you, Madam Mother, asked Lori, leaning over Mrs. March's chair with an affectionate look and tone he always gave her. No, thank you, except... Call at the office if you'll be so kind, dear. It's our day for a letter, and the postman hasn't been. Father is as regular as the sun, but there's some delay on the way, perhaps. So she's noting that they usually get a letter from their from Mr. March on this day, but it hasn't come. A sharp ring interrupted her, and a minute after, Hannah came in with a letter. It's one of them horrid telegraph things, Mum, she said, handing it as if she was afraid it would explode and do some damage. At the word telegraph, Mrs. March snatched it, read the two lines it contained, and dropped back into her chair as white as if the little paper had been had sent a bullet to her heart. Lori dashed downstairs for water while Meg and Hannah supported her, and Joe read aloud in a frightened voice, Mrs. March, your husband is very ill. Come at once. S. Hale, blank hospital, Washington. That's our answer to question one. How still the room was as they listened breathlessly, how strangely the day darkened outside, and how suddenly the whole world seemed to change as the girls gathered about their mother, feeling as if all the happiness and support of their lives was about to be taken from them. Mrs. March was herself again directly, read the message over, and stretched out her arm, arms to her daughters, saying, in a tone they never forgot, I shall go at once, but it may be too late. Oh, children, children, help me to bear it. So what does she mean? She's going to go to Washington, which in this case is Washington, D.C. And she says it may be too late. What does that mean if it's too late? Yeah, I mean, she's worried that maybe he will have died before she gets there. For several minutes, there was nothing but the sound of sobbing in the room, mingled with broken words of comfort, tender assurances of help, and hopeful whispers that died away in tears. Poor Hannah was the first to recover, and with unconscious wisdom, she set all the rest a good example. 
for with her, work was a panacea for most afflictions. The Lord keep the dear man. I won't waste no time a crying, but get your things <clears throat> ready right away, Mum. she said heartily, as she wiped her face on her apron, gave her mistress a warm shake of the hand with her own hard one, and went away to work like three women in one. She's right. There's no time for tears now. Be calm, girls, and let me think. They tried to be calm, poor things, as their mother sat up, looking pale but steady, and put away her grief to think of a plan, think and plan for them. Where's Laurie? she asked presently, when she had collected her thoughts and decided on the first duties to be done. Here, ma'am, oh, let me do something, cried the boy, hurrying from the next room whither he had withdrawn, feeling that their first sorrow was too sacred for even his friendly eyes to see. Send a telegram saying I will come at once. The next train goes early in the morning. I'll take that. What else? The horses are ready. I can go anywhere. Do anything, he said, looking ready to fly to the ends of the earth. Leave a note at Aunt March's. Joe, give me that pen and paper. Tearing off the blank side of one of her newly copied pages, Joe drew the table before her mother, well knowing the, that money for the long, sad journey must be borrowed, and feeling as if she could do anything to add a little to the sum for her father. Now go, dear, <clears throat> but don't kill yourself driving at a desperate pace. There is no need of that. Mrs. March's warning was evidently thrown away, for five minutes later, Laurie tore by the window on his own fleet horse, riding as if for his life. So we see that Mrs. March is writing to ask Great Aunt March for money to afford the trip. Joe, run to the rooms and tell Mrs. Com King that I can't come. On the way, get these things. I'll put them down. They'll be needed and I must go prepared for nursing. Hospital stores are not always good. Beth, go and ask Mr. Lawrence for a couple bottles of old wine. I'm not too proud to beg for father. He shall have the best of everything. Amy, tell Hannah to get down the black trunk. And Meg, come and help me find my things, for I'm half bewildered. Writing, thinking, and directing all at once might well bewilder the poor lady. And Meg begged her to sit quietly in her room for a little while and let them work. Everyone scattered like leaves before a gust of wind, and the quiet, happy household was broken up as suddenly as if the paper had been an evil spell. Mr. Lawrence came hurrying back with Beth, bringing every comfort the kind old gentleman could think of for the invalid, and friendliest promises of protection for the girls during the mother's absence, which comforted her very much. There was nothing he didn't offer, from his own dressing gown to himself as escort. But that last was impossible. Mrs. March would not hear of the old gentleman's undertaking the long journey. Yet an expression of relief was visible when he spoke of it, for anxiety ill fits one for traveling. He saw the look, knit his heavy eyebrows, rubbed his hands, and marched abruptly away, saying he'd be back directly. So we see that Mr. Lawrence offered to go with Mrs. March on this trip, and she knew that he probably wouldn't be able to handle a long train trip with his age. But Mr. March or Mr. Lawrence observed that she kind of looked relieved at the suggestion that he might go. So he saw that, he kind of looked and got thoughtful and left and said he'd be back directly. So I am making a prediction from that that Mr. Lawrence maybe has an alternative plan for how someone might ease Mrs. March's anxiety and join her on a journey. The journey. No one had time to think of him again till, as Meg ran through the entry with a pair of rubbers in one hand and a cup of tea in the other, she came suddenly upon Mr. Brooke. I'm very sorry to hear of this, Miss March, he said, in the kind, quiet tone which sounded very pleasantly to her perturbed spirit. I came to offer myself as escort to your mother. Mr. Lawrence has commissions for me in Washington, and it will give me real satisfaction to be of service to her there. So we see Mr. Lawrence, he says that he, Mr. Lawrence has things that he needs me to do. So as long as I'm going, I'll accompany your mother. So again, this is Mr. Lawrence thinking of a creative way to offer services without um, giving them an opportunity to say, no, 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 it's too much. Because he's going to say, well, I was going to send him already. Down dropped the rubbers, that's boots, and the tea was very near following as Meg put out her hand with a face so full of gratitude that Mr. Brooke would have felt repaid for a much greater sacrifice than the trifling one of time and comfort which he was about to make. How kind you all are. Mother will accept, I'm sure, and it will be such a relief to know that she has someone to take care of her. Thank you very, very much. 
Meg spoke earnestly and forgot herself entirely till something in the brown eyes looking down at her made her remember the cooling tea and lead the way into her parlor, the parlor, saying she could call her mother. Everything was arranged by the time Lori returned with a note from Aunt March enclosing the desired sum and a few lines repeating what she had often said before, that she had always told them it was absurd for March to go into the army, always predicted that no good would come of it, and she hoped they would take her advice next time. Mrs. March put the note in the fire, the money in her purse, and went on with her preparations, with her lips folded tightly in a way which Joe would have understood if she had been there. So we know from their conversations with one another, right, that when Mrs. March purses her lips tightly, it's because she's angry. And we can assume or we can understand why she might be angry, right? She had to humble herself to ask for money. And Aunt March gave the money, but along with a note that said, I told you so, nothing ever was going to come of this that was good. And, and meanwhile, Mrs. March is worried for her husband and his health. He was worried that he might die. So maybe the note at that point isn't an appropriate note to be sending. And I told you so note. So it's making her very angry. The short afternoon wore away. All the other errands were done and Meg and her mother busy at some necessary needlework while Beth and Amy got tea and Hannah finished her ironing with what she called a slap and a bang. But still, Joe did not come. They began to get anxious, and Lori went off to find her, for no one ever knew what freaks Joe might take into her head. He missed her, however, and she came walking in with a very queer expression of countenance, for there was a mixture of fun and fear, satisfaction and regret in it, which puzzled the family as much as did the roll of bills she laid before her mother, saying with a little choke in her voice, there's my contribution toward making father comfortable and bringing him home. My dear, where did you get it? $25? Joe, I hope you haven't done anything rash. So a reminder, right, this $25 would have been worth a lot more at this time than we think of now. So she went and got money somehow. So we're getting to our answer to question four soon. No, it's mine, honestly. I didn't beg, borrow, or steal it. I earned it. And I don't think you'll blame me, for I only sold what was my own. As she spoke, Joe took off her bonnet and a general outcry arose for all her abundant hair was cut short. Your hair, your beautiful hair. Oh, Joe, how could you? Your one beauty. My dear girl, there was no need of this. She doesn't look like my Joe anymore, but I love her dearly for it. As everyone exclaimed and Beth hugged the cropped head tenderly, Joe assumed an indifferent air. So she's kind of acting like, oh, it's no big deal. It's just my hair which did not deceive anyone a particle, and said, rumpling up the brown bush and trying to look as if she liked it. It doesn't affect the fate of a nation, so don't wail, Beth. It will be good for my vanity. I was getting too proud of my wig. It will do my brains good to have that mop taken off. My head feels deliciously light and cool, and the barber said I could soon have a curly crop, which will be boyish becoming and easy to keep in order. I'm satisfied, so please, take the money and let's have supper. So we just talked about question four and then question five is asking about themes. So I'm kind of reflecting, I mean, there might be a couple of options today for um, our themes. So picking from one of these options and making sure of course to restate the question in your answer. Tell me all about it, Joe. I am not quite satisfied, but I can't blame you, for I love how willingly you sacrificed your vanity, as you call it, to your love. But, my dear, it was not necessary, and I'm afraid you will regret it one of these days, said Mrs. March. No, I won't, returned Joe stoutly, feeling much relieved that her prank was not entirely condemned. What made you do it, asked Amy, who would as soon have thought of cutting off her head as her pretty hair. Well, I was wild to do something for father, replied Joe, as they gathered about the table, for healthy young people can eat even in the midst of trouble. I hate to borrow as much as mother does, and I knew Aunt March would croak. She always does, if you ask for a ninepence. Meg gave all her quarterly salary toward the rent, and I only got some clothes with mine, so I felt wicked and was bound to have some money if I sold the nose off my face to get it. You needn't feel wicked, my child. You had no winter things and got the simplest with your own hard earnings, said Mrs. March, with a look that warmed Joe's heart. I hadn't the least idea of selling my hair at first, 
But as I, as I went along, I kept thinking what I could do and feeling as if I'd like to dive into some of the rich stores and help myself. In a barber's window, I saw tails of hair with the prices marked and one black tail, not so thick as mine, was $40. It came over me all of a sudden that I had one thing to make money out of. And without stopping to think, I walked in, asked if they bought hair and what they would give for mine. I don't see how you dared to do it, said Beth in a tone of awe. Oh, he was a little man who looked as if he merely lived to oil his hair. He rather stared at first as if he wasn't used to having girls bounce into a shop and ask him to buy their hair. He said he didn't care about mine. It wasn't the fashionable color and he never paid much for it in the first place. The work put into it made it dear and so on. It was getting late and I was afraid if it wasn't done right away that I shouldn't have it done at all. And you know, when I start to do a thing, I hate to give it up. So I begged him to take it and told him why I was in such a hurry. It was silly, I dare say, but it changed his mind for I got rather excited and told the story in my topsy-turvy way. And his wife heard and said so kindly, take it, Thomas, and oblige the young lady. I'd do as much for our Jimmy any day if I had a spire of hair worth selling. <clears throat> So his wife is talking about how she would sell her hair if, if anyone would buy it for Jimmy. Who was Jimmy, asked Amy, who liked to have things explained as they went along. Her son, she said, who was in the army. How friendly such things make strangers feel, don't they? She talked away all the time, the man clipped, and diverted my mind nicely. Didn't you feel dreadfully when the first cut came, asked Meg with a shiver. I took a last look at my hair while the man got his things, <clears throat> and that was the end of it. I never snivel over trifles like that. I will confess, though, I felt queer when I saw the dear old hair laid out on the table and felt only the short, rough ends of my head. It almost seemed as if I had an arm or a leg off. The woman saw me look at it and picked out a long lock for me to keep. I'll give it to you, Marmy, just to remember past glories by. For a crop is so comfortable, I don't think I shall ever have a mane again. Mrs. March folded the wavy chestnut lock and laid it away with a short gray one in her desk. She only said, thank you, dearie. But something in her face made the girls change the subject and talk as cheerfully as they could about Mr. Brooks' kindness, the prospect of a fine day tomorrow, and the happy times they would have when father came home to be nursed. No one wanted to go to bed when at 10 o'clock, Mrs. March put by the last finished job and said, come girls. Beth went to the piano and played the father's favorite hymn. All began bravely, but broke down one by one till Beth was left alone singing with all her heart. For to her, music was always a sweet consoler. Go to bed and don't talk, for we must be up early and shall need all the sleep we can get. Good night, my darling, said Mrs. March as the hymn ended, for no one cared to try another. They kissed her quietly and went to bed as silently as if the dear invalid lay in the next room. Beth and Amy soon fell asleep in spite of their great trouble, but Meg lay awake, thinking the most serious thoughts she had ever known in her short life. Jo lay motionless, and her sister, sister fancied that she was asleep, till a stifled sob made her exclaim as she touched a wet cheek, <gasps> Joe, dear, what is it? Are you crying about father? No, not now. What then? My, my hair, burst out Joe, trying vainly to smother her emotion in the pillow. So after all this time, right, Joe's been saying, I don't cry about silly things like hair. Oh, no big deal. I don't miss it at all. But as soon as she thinks that everyone's asleep and she's alone in bed, she starts to cry about her lost hair. It did not sound at all comical to Meg, who kissed and caressed the afflicted heroine in the tenderest manner. I'm not sorry, protested Joe with a choke. I'd do it again tomorrow if I could. It's only the vain, selfish part of me that goes and cries in this silly way. Don't tell anyone. It's all over now. I thought you were asleep, so I just made a little private moan for my one beauty. How came you to be awake? I can't sleep. I'm so anxious, said Meg. Think about something pleasant and you'll soon drop off. I tried it but felt wider awake than ever. What did you think of? Handsome faces. Eyes particularly, answered Meg, smiling to herself in the dark. So we're seeing the answer to question six just there. What color of eyes do you like best? Brown. That is sometimes 
Blue are lovely. Joe laughed and Meg sharply ordered her not to talk, then amiably promised to make her hair curl and fell asleep to dream of living in her castle in the air. The clocks were striking midnight and the rooms were very still as a figure glided quietly from bed to bed, smoothing a coverlet here, settling a pillow there, and pausing to look long and tenderly at each unconscious face, to kiss each with lips that mutely blessed, and to pray the fervent prayers which only mothers utter. As she lifted the curtain to look out into the dreary night, the moon broke suddenly from behind the clouds and shone upon her like a bright benignant face, which seemed to whisper in the silence, be comforted, dear soul. There is always light behind the clouds. Okay, so for question six, Meg tells us directly. We can look at the text and find a direct answer to what Meg is thinking about. But then I have you ask you to infer whom do you infer that Meg is thinking of. And so we have some hints and we have to kind of think about, and this comes from Joe asking her what color eyes she likes best. Okay, and she says brown. Well, blue is nice too. Okay, so you have to kind of think a little bit and make an inference about who it seems that Meg is likely thinking about. We know what it is, but we have to infer who it is because we don't actually get told. Okay, I'm eager. I always am eager to see inferences from you. All. I love to see what you're inferring, what you're getting from the text as we read. So I'm eager to see your inferences today. Um, if you have questions, reach out and we can connect and try and talk through some of those things. Good luck.